Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for On the Money, presented by Embassy National Bank. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of On the Money, the number one small business show on Business Radio X. And latest numbers are in. We're up to uh, about 150,000 listeners for every show. So thanks for that. Um, Growing all the time. Um, the show is presented by Embassy National Bank. Embassy National Bank is the na- is a nationally chartered financial institution whose deposits are insured by the FDIC. On this show, we discuss topics designed to help small business succeed. Because at Embassy National Bank, we're proud of how we help small business. I'm Joe Moss, your host and the president at the bank, and we welcome you to the Subaru of Gwinnett Studio. So today um, we're going to talk about um, a subject that I wonder about all the time. So, um, Mike, thank you for setting this up. Um, we're here today with Mark Dunalo and Jim Bernard, who started a company called Sales Globe. Welcome, folks. Thank you, Joe. Thanks Great for having us. And uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about Sales Globe and a little bit about your background. Well, I, I got the company started about seven years ago because I had been doing consulting for years. I'd also done some startup companies for a number of years, and I saw a need to do something different in terms of helping companies think differently about how to solve sales problems. And when I say sales problems, what I'm talking about more specifically is sales effectiveness. So how do you improve the effectiveness of the sales organization? So that could be through, as we're gonna talk about today, sales compensation, so paying them more effectively, aligning rewards with what they do designing a more effective sales strategy. So who are we going to go after in the market? And how are we going to align the sales force? How do we train and develop our team? So we work in areas like that. My background is a little unorthodox in that I think of myself kind of as an art school MBA. So I actually didn't start in business years ago. I went to art school. And after art school in Philadelphia, I went off to New York for a few years and worked as a designer. Loved doing that, but then I got a taste of the business side when I went over to the account side and started working with a few large accounts. And unlike a lot of my friends, I didn't go off and get my master's in fine arts. I went off and got a a master's in in business administration, MBA, which kind of put me on another path. So as I was trying to get a job coming out of business school, what I found out was nobody wanted to hire the art guy. So I had to put all that in the closet until a few years later when I figured out a lot of the solutions we were developing actually drew upon creative principles. So that we started to incorporate in our work, and that was one of the reasons I started Sales Globe because I thought we really need to do something differently in how we work in a formal way with companies through problem-solving processes. So that's a bit about about what we do. Good. We work across uh, industries. We work with companies that are small businesses as well as mid-caps and some large companies as well, and mostly uh, we work with business-to-business sales organizations. Okay. And uh, Jim, tell me about your background. Yeah, my background for the last 20 years, uh, up until joining Mark a little less than a year ago, was primarily focused in the high-tech industry, managing sales operations globally for a number of both large and small companies. As part of that that uh, experience, it, sales operations is a more broad perspective of sales execution within companies. So whereas, you know, I come to this uh organization as a practitioner and been working in this field for the last 20 years, not just with sales compensation, but the whole host of sales effectiveness topics that Mark's talking about. So as as you go through the, the machination of developing a sales compensation, compensation program, for example, I would be the one that would actually work through those details, make it an operating model that could be executed against. And, and, so much has changed in this world or in this whole area over the years uh we have a gentleman that's on the show every once in a while who is from the old ibm big blue days and you know where they had an excellent sales organization and i'm i'm sure they i get i'm sure you have to comp people a lot differently today than you may have done back in those days sure sure there there's a whole host of variables that that have caused a number of those changes but um, suffice it to say that your assumption is absolutely correct. We pay people quite a bit different today than what we did, say, 20 years ago. Mark, you mentioned um, looking at the effectiveness of the sales force, and uh, you mentioned comp in that. But let me ask you this. Where does, on a, 
you know, if you look at your top five items, where does comp stand in making your sales force more effective? Well, that's a great question. We tend to think of compensation as an enabling discipline, which means it enables other things, other decisions that we make. So I think one of the pitfalls that companies run into on sales compensation is they jump right to the compensation plan as the source of the issue and maybe as the solution for whatever the problem might be. When in fact, what you want to do is you want to move a few layers up. So we use a a tool called the Revenue Roadmap. And Revenue Roadmap basically answers the question, how do organizations perform well from a sales standpoint if they're doing well? And what we find there are really four major competency areas or four major uh, layers that they work within. One is uh, the layer of of, uh, insight, which is understanding what the organization is doing, how it's performing, what customers are looking for. Uh, how the competitors are performing, so understanding our overall market environment, then that layer of insight informs what we call the strategy, or think about it as a sales strategy, which is just a fancy word for your action plan to achieve your goal. So sales strategy would look at things like who are we selling to, our segments, uh, what we're offering in terms of our products and services, our value proposition, so what makes us special, and then our overall go-to-market plan. Bring that down to the next layer, which would be coverage, which would look at things like what channels or routes to market do we use to access customers? What does our sales organization look like? What does our sales process look like? Uh, Feed on the street question, how many people do we need out there? We call that deployment. So once you get through those questions, you have an enablement layer below that. So you have things like sales compensation, uh, tools, training, technology, uh, recruiting, and hiring and retention. And so sales compensation has to respond to a lot of the decisions that we make in the upstream discipline. So all that to say, when you look at sales compensation, a lot of times the issues that you see with the sales compensation plan are not sales compensation issues proper, but they're things that are driven from other decisions. So we may find that our sales process is not clearly defined or our roles are not clearly defined. So that's the first place we start is we look upstream to understand what the big priorities are and what decisions have been made and how sales compensation should reflect that. And Jim, I'm sure you've seen this over the years. It takes a special kind of person to be an effective salesman or per- salesperson, irrespective of what the comp plan is. Absolutely. Everyone has an opinion as to what makes a good salesman, but rarely do they really understand what those, what those key skills are and what the challenges are on an everyday basis. What do and, you think, the, let's, let's talk about that, what do you think the key skills are? What do you see when you, you – I've, I've been around a lot of – I don't consider myself a salesperson, but I've been mm-hmm. around a lot, and um, I've got my own ideas, but what do you see making an effective salesperson? I, I think it varies a lot depending on which type of, of sales organization you're, you're living in. Uh, it totally depends on the product. And that's why this model that Mark was talking about as far as the revenue roadmap becomes an an excellent framework to help define some of those variables. If you're selling a commodity product that is readily available from a number of customers, that selling motion is totally different from a highly specialized, highly technical product that may require a whole sales support organization behind it. So, and the skills in those two extremes are also considerably different as far as the people type person that you would look for. Mm -hmm. Um, But in general, I mean, just talking about sales in general, one of the biggest skills that I always look for is listening. The ability to somebody to sit down and have a conversation with a customer, understand what their business is about and what their key challenges are. Mm -hmm. If they can't get past that gate at the outset, they're going to have a hard time being successful. And- a lot of people will hear you say that and go, wait a minute, that's not what I thought. Most people will say, well, I thought salespeople talked all the time. But, the effect, but, but Mark, the effective salesperson does listen and, from what I've learned, tries to solve a problem. That, that's absolutely true, and I think that's the problem uh, that you just state there is they talk all the time. We do this exercise with sales organizations when we're doing training, and we put them in a hypothetical customer situation. You're going to go into a sales call the next day. We ask them to write on a flip chart what you're going to talk about. And so what they'll do on the flip chart is they'll write a list of things, and we'll identify usually that list of things contains mostly things that they're interested in. And then we say, okay, now switch around and think about it from your customer's perspective. What's your customer thinking about? 
they're thinking that they may not want to have this meeting. They may not have time. They may not have budget. They've got other issues they're trying to solve beyond what you're dealing with. And so if you start to listen for those things, then you're going to become more effective. That's, I think that's a primary skill is listening. You have other classic skills that are really important, such as goal orientation, uh, drive, ability to compete, uh, of course, problem solving ability. That's one that we work on a lot is how do you develop solutions? Because when you listen to the customer, they will tell you something, but very often what they tell you is not exactly what they need. So if I'm a good problem solver, I can take that statement that they're, ta- they're giving me and I can start to redefine that and go deeper and really understand what they're trying to solve. I can find the root cause. I can start to look at different types of solutions that we might offer them. So you want to listen, but you also need to be a really effective problem solver with that listening. Jim, what about um, when you go into companies, are are there some pretty basic mistakes that you see companies making within the sales process that kind of repeat themselves time after time? Yeah, number one is to have an established sales process that they use so that the selling motion is the same and repeatable across each one of the, the people on the staff. Very, very important. And also clearly defining what that support model looks like behind them. Because it's not just a sales guy that goes out and positions the product on the street. Typically, the whole pricing motion, the proposal motion, requires some level of support uh, from people in the background. So it's really understanding all of that. And, for example, in our world, in the lending process, um, that is very, very true. You, We can't be effective on the front unless we're effective on the back. And a lot of times the processor person whatever they'll spend as much time on the phone with the customer as the loan officer will so it's got to be effective all the way through and everybody somehow has to be on the same page right you you might think of that idea of process but also customer experience to take take the banking business as an example a lot of companies in the financial services industry will tell us you know, we have the same product to offer essentially as our competitors. Our rates are about the same. You know, they're, they're kind of in some relevant range there. So we have to figure out what to do beyond that, mm-hmm. that augmented product or that value proposition. So taking, as Jim said, that sales process and figuring out how are we going to create a different customer experience? How are we going to differentiate? Because you've got multiple contact points. It's not just one salesperson. You've got multiple contact points, and each of them has to create a certain experience that that customer is looking for go back to the earlier comment on listening, that we have to listen to the voice of the customer to know what that experience is that they want. Mm -hmm. Um, All right, who wants to talk about comp first? Let's move into comp. Do you want to start? I'll give it a go. All right, just that example (laughs) right there. Um, uh, Salesperson goes out, gets a deal, uh, has a lot of support from people to get that first product out the door, to maintain uh, help, quality, all those things in our world getting it closed but so often i see the the salesperson getting comped for on some type of a bonus level where everybody in the back is kind of forgotten um so is that something you see a lot of what are some of the i mean it it what are some of the fixes to that how do you blend those two so when you say everybody in the back is forgotten you mean in the back supporting that person correct in the sale yeah right right well, the thing we, we will usually look for is the question of influence or control. So what kind of influence or control does that person have over the outcome of the sale? The greatest level of influence is usually as an individual right at the point of purchase or right at the point of sale or the, the team that's touching the customer. And as you start to step back and you start going into, say, service or operations roles, you'll see that level of individual influence start to decrease. That doesn't mean those roles aren't, aren't important, but in the pay plan, what we'll usually see, which may not be the right answer, is those people may not have any type of incentive. What we like to see is we like to identify the things that they can control that are going to result in the, a good or successful outcome of the sale. It may be that they do have some level of influence in the ultimate sales outcome. It may be they have some level of influence in terms of the effectiveness of the bid or the proposal or the delivery of the service. So we want to find those levers that they can control, and we do like to put incentive compensation on those types of roles in the back room that are supporting. It's just got to be appropriate to the level of influence, and when we get to selecting performance measures, it has to be the right measure. So if I am in the 
say I'm in the accounting department and I support the sales process, to measure me on sales may not be the right thing. That may be actually an overall measure from the company perspective. Correct. I may get some measure like that. But the thing I might be able to control is perhaps uh, uh, de- the receivables, outstanding receivables. So that may be a very important measure because it increases our cash flow. So that may be something that I'm compensated on um, in, in addition to maybe an overall sales number. Operations, same thing. It may be efficiency or profitability, the operations delivery. The, I think the complaint a lot of people have when they look at salespeople is they say, wow, you know, we all worked hard, but they made so much money. Right. And kind of the off-the-cuff response we, we'll give and we, we often hear is, well, if you want to be in sales, put half your pay at risk, and you can do that too. Right. But that's kind of the crass answer. I think the real answer is it, it, it steps back in different degrees according to level of influence. And and not everybody requires the salesperson to put half their comp at risk as well. Correct. So right. That varies. That varies depending on the depending, comp- uh, yeah. the position. Yeah. We, we have a concept called pay mix, which is typically the ratio of base salary to incentive compensation. And for somebody on the front line that Mark was describing as far as the salesperson where put 50% of your pay at risk, that's indeed what they do. Half of their overall compensation is linked to their direct performance against sales objectives. Whereas somebody in the back office may be supporting them and putting them in a good position to win, but you might see a much lower percentage of their overall compensation that's tied to the actual results from the company. And one of the key concepts there that we always like to talk about is alignment between the front office and the back office and making sure that as you set some of these targets and some of these goals, that they're measured similarly and that they're aligned across to the different members of the team. Well, you're listening to On the Money, and uh, this is Joe Moss, your moderator, brought to you by Embassy National Bank. We're talking to the principals, Mark Donalo and Jim Bernard of Sales Globe. We're talking about sales <clears throat> effectiveness, and now we're kind of moving into the comp question, which uh, is a, is, is a, it's not a one-size-fits-all, is it? Never is. Never is. Which, again, without I'm, – I'm not trying to, to repeat myself, but that, that roadmap that you've got under your, your hand there that Mark spoke to. Is again, this in the book? That is in the book. It is, yeah. And it is, it is probably the hallmark foundational model that we use in the practice every single day. Hmm. In our conversations with customers, we'll touch on many of the boxes that are in that revenue roadmap and those different levels of, of information. How it, often – and, and – anybody jump in on this how often you come into an organization and you realize that wait a minute the sales comp plan is kind of messed up we need to change this thing do you see that a lot we do we do in fact what we'll usually see is the sales compensation plan needs to be improved but it's usually other things that are connected to it as well as we had spoken about before so it's it's very common for us to come in under a sales compensation question so and we usually will come in on questions or or issues and that question might be we're not getting the performance we need from our sales team we have high turnover we don't have the productivity we need the compensation plan is the answer must be something wrong with the compensation plan but we'll we'll find that there are other well that's the first thing you run to right right. so we're so that's that that's probably the most visible thing and that's one of the I think great ironies of the sales compensation plan is on the surface, we tend to think of commission rates. We think of it, of the mathematical components of the compensation plan. I think one of the great ironies is it has a way of pointing out things that are not aligned in the rest of the organization. It's like a circuit breaker. And it also has probably a lot less to do with math than it does with behavior because it has to do with what people value. It has to do with communications. And it may be the way we structure the compensation plan may not be all about the math and the money. It may be about what really motivates people. We may find there are other things that that motivate people as well. So if you go in with the assumption that you're gonna look at at those compensation components of the classic ones, that may not be your ultimate answer. Um, That's a a good point. Um, And once you decide you need to change the plan, how do you how do you handle the transition without losing half your team? That's a very, very good question. And it's one that is constantly on the mind of, of every sales leader that's out there who's considering a change. Do you grandfather folks or you give them time to kind of get ready or 
depends on the level of change. If the level of change is pretty drastic, uh, you may want to look at some kind of transition plan. But more importantly, I, I mean, the compensation plan is one side of this. The other th is effective se quote setting of the quotas mm. and the targets that they're going to go after. Because you could have the best compensation plan in the world. And if you're not doing an effective job of setting the quotas and the targets, and the compensation plan is, is in effect, unachievable, you're going you're gonna to lose, you lose your sales team from that. Well, let's so talk it's a combination about, of both of what those a, Let's talk about quotas for a minute. Um, I suspect that not all quotas are being set based on the true facts. They're kind of, what do I want everybody to do this year? As opposed to, is it really possible? What should we be doing this year? And that is one of the big challenges that we see every day is that setting, setting, make. setting effective quotas is probably one of the top three or four challenges that our, our clients see every single day. And, you know, we, there are a number of different approaches. And it's again, it's going to vary customer or client to client. But one of the, the more general guidelines that I've always seen as being most effective is there are growth goals or, or business goals that a particular company will have to achieve or is looking to achieve, whether it's growth over last year's business plan or improvement in margin, et cetera. Those goals have to be translated down to the individual sales guys. What I have seen most effective in the past is to balance the business goals mm -hmm. at the top with a bottoms-up approach from the field that also takes into account some of the factors that maybe the other people haven't really thought about. So it's a more operational approach, bottoms up building of a business plan, customer by customer, account by account, uh, to then compare against what does this top-down view look like, and then you kind of tend to meet somewhere in the middle. Um, that's kind of what I'm familiar with, where you do a profit plan at, say, the board or executive level, and then you ask people, okay, what, what, what do you think? And then you try to merge the two. That is the tension. The classic approach is to take a historic approach, as, as Jim's describing, from the top and just, down. And just add. Right, right. And so you're, as you're saying, the, the pressure point usually is from the board or from investors uh, or the street. And right. there's a requirement for growth, and we push it down to the sales organization. And, and bottom up is usually um, about adjustments or things that may be aberrations rather than a true bottom up top down process. So we do want to we do want to have the top down, but we want to have bottom up. And, and there are a number of different methods that you can use that would range from looking at the potential according to uh, demographic factors of your of your market. So if you're selling uh, business equipment, you might look at a number of white collar workers in your market, and you can tally up uh, some estimates of what potential might be. So there are a number of ways of looking at potential. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that there's a balance between two things in quota setting, not just the top down and the bottom up, but between the opportunity in the market and also the Good capacity point. of the sales organization, the sales capacity. So the opportunity all talks about, well, what's out there and how should we allocate that out to the organization? The capacity side would say there is some practical limit to capacity of the sales organization and you can only push down so much on them. And we'll start to look at factors like how many people that you have. That's that's a very obvious one. So right. we could certainly add more people. We can look at the talent of people so you can increase the talent level. You can look at a really big one, which a lot of companies experience, but they don't fix, which is how much time is spent on actually selling what we think of as sales time allocation or the opposite of that, which is job contamination. So if we can deep decontaminate the sales role, that can make a huge difference. So on Talk average, about that for a minute. Right, kinda, right. You kind of lost me there a little bit. Okay, so on average, if you look at how much time a, a person spends, a salesperson spends on selling, it's usually about 50% of their time. Selling defined as on the street, on the phone, LinkedIn, all the whatever kind of stuff that they use. Well, we could, you know, so we could define it as customer contact time, which could be face-to-face, -face, or it could be on the phone, uh, or it could be on conference calls, or it could also be working on proposals or other things, uh, presentations, other things related to actual selling. Right. The other 50% is usually going to operations activities. It's going to uh, service activities, could be administrative, travel. And some of those are kind of blended. And you go, well, it's really important for me to do those things because I have to put out the fires in my accounts. But it's really not value-added for that particular sales job. So you can decontaminate and either eliminate some of those things 
or you can move them to the right roles. So you might move them to other types of service roles that can handle them. By doing that, if you can increase the percentage of time you're spending on selling, that increases your sales capacity. All of a sudden, your ability to hit quota goes up. So as an organization, that's a really big lever that you can pull. Now, when you talk about quotas, are you are, are you a fan of the what I would call um, well some of the big banks? I talked I've talked to platform and lenders and and tellers and branch managers and uh, even some of the big lenders uh, at these large organizations, and they are uh, as they are micromanaged. Um, they're given how many people did you talk to today? You got to talk to twenty people today, and do a check every time you talk to somebody. Um, others are, here's what I'm looking for, and here are some key things that I want you to hit, and it's up to you to get all that done, however you're most effective. So where do you see companies going with that? Well, as the You know, I think it was Amazon got in trouble for, or got a little pushback because they wanted to clock every five minutes of a person's time, I think. <laughs> Right, right. Well, the micromanagement is only, and, and we <laughs> would never condone micromanagement, but the tighter management is usually more appropriate for entry-level roles. So you're coming into the organization. We're going to teach you how to be successful. So as somebody's onboarding in an organization, we will see that, which is how many calls did you make? How many proposals did you create? So we're teaching you the activities that you, you should be doing in order to be successful. But then as you become more seasoned, as the competency of the organization increases or the individual increases, you usually start to pull back on those types of things. So we start to get into more of a mode of, we think of paying for results, managing two activities. So what do you manage to versus what you pay for? So we start giving them the big messages. So here's your quota. It's you know $3 million a year, whatever the number might be. Here's your quota. And we expect that you're going to hit that quota because you know how to hit that quota. That doesn't mean we still don't give coaching. Like, let's do a bottom-up build on your $3 million quota. Find how out many, where it's going to come from. Right. How many prospects do you need to touch? What's the average deal size? That kind of thing. Right. Salespeople, I find, always need help with that because you give them $3 million, it's like, that's too big of a number. I could never do it. Okay, let's break it down. So with the methodology of how they're going to do that, coaching is very effective. Coaching is a lot different than micromanaging. So coaching is coming in, taking a look at your plan, how you're performing, what activities you're doing, but it's, it's in a more constructive way rather than kind of more of a flogging way. What help do you need? What help do you need, right? How can we develop your capabilities? You know, the, uh, it's interesting. I flash back. I, do a lot of, uh, I did a lot of youth baseball coaching and um and the way i was coached in baseball was i was taught to do these things and if you do these things then all the other stuff will take care of itself um so i found coaches in the youth league were talking to these 12 year old kids going come on get a hit well they had no idea what that meant you know what does that mean get a hit well you, coach i'd love to get a hit i don't know how to get a hit so you have to go through the process of here's what you do. Here's how you, you're set up. Here's keeping your eye on the ball, you know, all the way through. And I found, and I guess that's the true with sales as well, that if you teach the mechanics, just like um, um, our uh, Saban over in Alabama, you teach the mechanics and the process, everything else is going to take care of itself. I think that's true. It's teaching the process. You mentioned mechanics. I think the mechanics are the foundational level of that. So – as Jim was saying before, here's the sales process. Here are the basic steps that we go through, and you need to do a certain number of these in order to, at a certain you know deal value in order to get to your quota. But after that, it really has to become about the practice and the habits. So you start to internalize those mechanics and turn them into practices and habits, and it becomes a way of working. So that's really important that people make that transition, and then to the point we made before about listening and problem solving, you start to layer those skills in because you could say, generate a certain number of proposals or having a certain number of sales calls. But if I'm going into the sales call and I'm, I'm talking and not asking questions, or if I'm putting a proposal together and I'm just doing a copy and paste of what a prior proposal looked like and I'm not actually problem solving, I'm not going to have the results I could have. So you have to layer in some of those skills, those softer skills on top of those, those mechanics as well. And, and I think, Jim, you mentioned that, that, that some jobs, uh, some sales jobs don't lend themselves to problem solving. It's just mm -hmm. all about how many people you touch. How many orders you can take. Yeah. For example. Yeah, I mean, if you're selling pens, you know, yep. 
um, I don't know what kind of problem somebody would have that you're going to fix by selling them more pins unless it's a custom-made pin. It's got a nice trademark on it. Um, those you can kind deliver of things. faster. Yeah. You know, you've got more color variation. I mean, there's a whole host of things that you can use to differentiate. I guess every product, even though it's a commodity, can be differentiated. In fact, you've yeah. got to find a way to differentiate it. We deal with that all the time. It's the companies the time. come to us and they, they say we've got a commoditized product and we need to do something to to differentiate. Take take pens and pencils. That's a great one. If you take the major office products companies, oil um, and gas products, right? Same thing, right? Commodity oil and gas products. So we've got to find a way to create a differentiated value proposition. So what we're doing is we're saying that oil and gas product or that that pen uh, or pencil those are really mechanical elements of a bigger solution that we're providing. Maybe the bigger solution is how do we make our team more effective through the right supplies? How do we deliver the oil and gas in a, in a different way to, to meet the needs of the business? So we're looking for those kind of answers. And, and what I have found is that, well, one, customers will deal with you if they know you can deliver and that you know you can be trusted. If mm -hmm. your word is, if you say you're going to do it on this particular date and that happens then I'm probably going to come back to you again, even if I have to pay you a little bit more money than another product. Trust is certainly a basis of, of any relationship, and it, and it certainly holds true in sales, even more so. Um, let's go back to the comp plan for a minute. Um, are you a fan of, depending on the person, having a different comp plan? Or do you are you... You kind of have to have a same comp plan across the board. I'm a fan of leadership. Okay. And for me, giving people too many choices is not showing clear leadership. And I we've, we've seen this before where companies will say, well, we want to have a plan where people can kind of pick what they'd like to be on. Do they want to be on the 50-50 plan and take more risk and have more upside? Or do they want to be on the 70-30 plan and have a little bit more security? Well, there's really a right answer for that role. And so we can determine what the right answer for that role is. I, I think in some cases having some flexibility is fine, but it's not the majority of cases. I think understanding what we want in that role is, 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 uh, is really important. Now, if you have differences, you could have the same role and differences in, say, geography. So say we've got uh, sales organizations across the world in a particular role. You're going to have cultural differences. You're going to have legal differences. You're going to have differences that you're going to want to account for in the compensation plan because somebody in Asia is going to uh, be motivated by different things than somebody, say, in the U.S. So we may have some different measures or different pay mixes, but usually within a geography, within a market, we'll try to keep things pretty consistent. Certainly consistency by role is very, very important. Uh, and when you start getting too much variation, you start to begin to worry about complexity and the administration of that plan. Well, so, some of the some of the books and writings and articles these days talk about how different people want different things in their comp plan. Um, so there's got to be, I would guess, a, some there's got to be some flexibility, but maybe you don't want to make it completely across the board, like. Somebody may say, um, you know what, I'd like more, if I make this sale, I'd like some more time off. Somebody else may say, if I make this sale, I want the dollars, you know, and I, you know. Right. So what we would try to do would be to differentiate between the core compensation plan and the overall employee value proposition, because there are a lot of different pieces, like you mentioned, that you can play with, that you can, you can make a difference for. So you could say the overall employee value proposition is the compensation plan. It's things like your benefits, it's your um, uh, job uh, content, it's the affiliation with a great company, it's your career path. There are a number of different levers we can play with there. So we might say, if somebody is a millennial, we know they value some things differently than maybe somebody that's a baby boomer. So we and may- And by the way, when you figure out how millennials think, you just let me we're know. We're all working on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they we know, know yet. They don't but think like us. <laughs> We've just dated ourselves. Wait a minute. I just had a big sale. What are you going to do for me now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, so so I, I think you're hitting exactly the point that to be so monolithic about it, Joe, to say we're only going to have one way of rewarding people. Let's use the bigger word of rewards. One way of rewarding people would not be as effective as having 
some options for how we can reward people. Sure, but at the end of the day, you've got to line it up with the company's strategies. And you no do. Doubt. And so I would ask one question on variations within the compensation plan, as Jim points out. If you start changing things within such a core component of of the, the program like that, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of that in the end? So we look back and we go, well, how many people hit quota at the end of the year? How many people were able to achieve the strategic objectives? Well, gosh, we had five different flavors of the comp plan. How do we actually isolate for all those variations and all those differences? Versus we had a comp plan that we know fits the core role of this job, but we had overall rewards components that maybe does give somebody time off uh, if, they're, if they do certain things, but it's not part of the sales compensation plan sure. proper. Makes sense. Uh, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, one of the other key, key things that I think that plays into this in your initial question about, well, I want to I be paid this way, right? It's getting the input from the whole organization on what an effective compensation plan looks like. You know, sure, we'll start talking to the executives about C-level goals and really understanding what the overall objectives are for the company. But one of the things that I always did for the last 20 years was also include a lot of the grassroots people in the in the field as far as input what's working for you for the plan this year what's not working what what could we do better uh, and we actually do that as well with with the the practice that we have uh, we'll go in and and discuss and have interviews with executives and key stakeholders in a company but we'll also do a survey of all of the sales field as far as getting their understanding, how competitive they feel their plan is. I think is. that's actually more important. Um, t- to me, I think that is uh, a little bit more important because you really, one of the things that the boardroom, what can happen at the boardroom or the C-level is they, for whatever reason, don't have a grasp as to what is really going on. Yeah. I mean, they're told what they want to hear. Um, and a lot of times they get the... Uh, the, the, the problem is that the salesperson really doesn't want to tell them what's really going on. They want to tell them what they think they want to hear. And in, in, it is surprising how many times when we work with sales teams, we come back to the uh, senior executives and we tell them things that they don't know. Or maybe we confirm suspicions, but people don't want to tell them those things so we can tell them, how their jobs are working, what people are actually doing, what people are actually seeing as priorities, how people, to your point before, are actually motivated. Sometimes what we'll find is that they're motivated by things other than the compensation plan. So it's important to to dig down. And I think a lot of organizations that self-medicate, if you will, and try to figure out the comp plan themselves, they don't actually get into the details of the organization to know those things. Yeah, and I I just, you know, we're we're Gosh, uh, we're at, I told you to go by fast. Um, we're at the end. We're going to have to uh, rotate you back in. Um, I want to read through this and try to get some uh, other real-world examples to talk about. But um, I think we overemphasize – the tendency is to overemphasize the comp plan. And I, and I think you're, 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 you basically are saying that's correct. I mean, it is a component of making the sales force more effective. Yeah. It may not be number one. Um, you know, the, there are a lot of pe- things that motivate people, and, and I, you know, comp is important. It's got to be right. they got to know that they're getting paid fairly to do a good job. But on the other hand, there's a lot more to it, you know, education, feeling part of the team, knowing that what they're doing is aligned with what you want me to do. I mean, there's just a lot more to it than just the comp plan. Sure. But if you don't do it right, it will become number one. So it's one of those things. You'll find out as they're walking out the door, right? Right, right. Salespeople aren't shy. It is not (laughs) not the solution to everything. It's not the panacea. But if you don't do it well, it it will become one of your biggest problems. Okay. Well, we've got to bring it to a a close here. So, um, Mark, give us some uh, parting wisdom. And then, Jim, you'll have your turn. Unless you want to do it the other way around. Well, uh, I'll jump in here. As you're, as you're thinking ahead and we're coming up on 2017 and you're thinking about compensation again, don't think of that as the ultimate solution, but think about what kind of changes in strategy you might be having for the upcoming year and whether the compensation plan still reflects your new strategy. 
And also think about the effectiveness of your plan and how it's worked for you over the past year. There are a number of analytics that you can run. So uh, in, in the book, What Your CEO Needs to Know About Sales Compensation, we show analytics that you can run. We show how to understand the effectiveness of the plan. So think about those things ahead of time. Get a, get a jump start on it. You usually do need to get started in, in August or September to be ready for a calendar year fiscal year. Okay. Jim? And, and if you're out there wondering how to get started, and, and most people understand if they've got a problem with sales compensation or with their sales model. They're not the only ones. Everybody struggles with this. The, the beautiful thing of this is that it's an annual exercise that you can go through and refresh and renew the program every year. Uh, you know, frequently, if you've got a good comp plan, it may just be a matter of tweaking it, right? It may not be wholesale changes, but um, this is a topic that, that certainly is on the top of every CEO's mind, every COO's mind. Uh, sales leaders, is, and it goes right down to the sales guys. So it's an important topic. I'm glad you had us in. Well, listen, um, everybody, Mark came in and gave me some homework right off the bat. Um, he's written a book called What Your CEO Needs to Know About Sales Compensation, Connecting the Corner Office to the Front Line. And um, as he told me right before the show, I've got about a week to read this. But um, – um, I'm looking forward to it because being a kind of coming up through the organization, not from the sales side, this is one of the things that that uh, I haven't necessarily been uh, trained on. Um, but everybody's got a little salesman in them, don't they? I think so. That's what it's about in the end. As I always say, Joe, sales is the top line on every income statement. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right, everybody. That was a great show. Um, thank you both for being on, uh, Mark Dunalo and Jim Bernard at Sales Globe, uh, www.salesglobe.com. And um, email will be posted on uh, our website, but um, uh, phone number 770-335-9225. Twitter is at Sales Globe Forum. So um, until next time, this is Joe Moss, and uh, this has been On the Money, the number one small business show on um, Business Radio X. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at on underscore the underscore money and then the number one. And you can listen to any of our shows anytime by visiting onthemoney.businessradiox.com. Uh, we're also out on iTunes. I, have, uh, I know a lot of people that are now um, – downloading the shows and listening to them in uh, rush hour um and uh we also are out on uh, youtube right now we've got a, a nice video of the show which is really i think enhances the effectiveness we're out there under the business radio x gwinnett youtube channel so thanks a lot for listening i'm joe moss with embassy national bank and please remember to be careful out there leave fear in the back seat and then most importantly Please stay authentic, stay true to yourself. That's the best thing that you can do. So, till next time, thanks. <laughs>